Um, I guess we'll get started. Here's Dan Magenheimer, and he's going to be talking about transcendent memory. Hi, everybody. I have a, a lot of slides, but uh, I'll be zooming through them pretty quickly. If you miss something, the slides are online, and I'll give you a URL at the end. Um, again, my name is Dan Magenheimer, and I work for Oracle in the U.S. in Colorado. And uh, um, I work on our Zen-based Oracle virtual, uh, virtual machine product called Oracle VM. And um, I'm going to be talking today about something called transcendent memory, which is a, a new approach to managing uh, physical RAM in a virtual environment. Um, I'm going to first be covering a motivation and talking about what the problem really is. Uh, in order to explain how transcendent memory helps, I need to provide some kind of overview. Those of you who are memory management, management experts in the audience will know all that, but uh, please bear with me while I cover some of the basics. Then we'll talk about what is transcendent memory, uh, show uh, it in action, and talk about some futures. So our motivation is that in many virtual data centers, uh, there's been a large number of virtual machines that have been consolidated into a much smaller number of physical machines. And uh, CPUs in many situations are, are um, still uh, spending a lot of time idle. And uh, this is because uh, in those systems, the real bottleneck is that there isn't enough memory in the virtualized system. So one obvious solution is you could add more memory. But that isn't always possible. Uh, you might have used up all the DIMM slots in your server or uh, maybe upgrading to the next level uh, from 4 gig DIMMs to 16 gig DIMMs or something is very, very expensive. Um, and in any case, why would you want to go spend more money on hardware if you're not sure whether you're utilizing the resources that you do have efficiently um, and not wasting them? So. Uh, existing tools that are available are, uh, are not uh, always very good at recognizing the symptoms of inefficiently uh, utilized memory. And some of the mechanisms uh, that I've got up here that are available today in virtual systems um, sometimes may hurt more than they help. So it's not uh, um, uncommon for a virtualization data center to have these features turned off just because they don't trust them. So... Um, before we try to solve the problem, let's, uh, let's talk about what the, what the problem is and uh, clearly identify what we're trying to do. Um, it may seem kind of simple, but what we're trying to do is optimize uh, across time, which means this is a constant problem, not just now, but for every uh, moment in the future as well, um, a distribution of um, physical memory that's RAM across a set of virtual machines. And we want to maximize that set of virtual machines at the same time. We're going to do that by measuring how much memory each virtual machine needs now and in the future. Then we're going to take memory away from those virtual machines that have too much and either give it to virtual machines that don't have enough or maybe provision it. Since we want to maximize the number of virtual machines, we can provision new virtual machines with that memory. And we want to do all that without suffering a significant performance penalty. So... Uh, that sounds like it might be a challenging problem, but why is this a hard problem? I mean, this is the virtualization. Virtualization has been around since the 60s. We know how to solve this problem for CPUs and for I.O. Um, why is it a hard problem when we're trying to do it for memory? And, and the very short answer, I'll get into a lot more detail, but the very short answer is that memory is not a renewable resource. A CPU, you have a new second of CPU time every second. With memory, you can't just randomly move everything around uh, whenever you want. It's, it's stuck there. It's not renewable. Um, so to explain that better, I, I, I first need to uh, take a uh, uh, look at a few points on how uh, physical memory is managed first in an operating system like Linux and then in a virtual machine monitor like Zen. So the first thing to notice is that an OS is a memory hog. Well, most OSs were written many years ago when uh, memory was a scarce and expensive resource. And uh, every bit of available memory had to be put to good use. So it's also, also almost always nearly the case that uh, the amount of memory that a physical system has is fixed. It doesn't change across time. So an OS um, 
tries its best to make use of the uh, fixed amount of memory that it does have by putting something into every place in memory that it can, as long as it can find any good reason at all to make use of that memory, okay? So as a result, if you, if you give an OS more memory, it's uh, going to essentially grow fat and use up whatever memory you give it, okay? So it's not very easy to tell if an OS uh, needs more memory, and it's not also very easy to tell if it's using the memory that it does have efficiently or not. Okay, so I'm going to dig a little deeper now, and uh, we're going to look at what uh, an operating system is doing with that memory. So to run it all, um, the OS needs some code and some data, and we can see that uh, in green up there. And if it's going to do anything useful, uh, the applications need some code and data, and we show that in blue. And uh, then there's this thing called the page cache. Well, what's a page cache? Um, because disks are slow, an OS is often going to try to keep a copy of its page, uh, pages that it's read from the disk in case it needs it again. So it, doesn't, it, has to, it can avoid then having to go out to disk and reading pages, the same page all over again. It's essentially trying to predict the future um, as to what pages it's going to need and what pages it's not. And though it's not perfect at that, it guesses right a lot of the time, which means the page cache concept works, and uh, that's why it exists in pretty much all modern operating systems. Um, so if uh, the OS attempts to predict the future and it guesses right, then we're going to call that a good page cache page, and we're going to represent that with this crystal ball symbol. So I said that the OS guesses right a lot of the time, but that also means that it guesses wrong a lot of the time. So that means a lot of the pages in the page cache have data that's not going to be used again in the future, and so it's wasting memory space. And we're going to represent that with uh, this symbol. So if you watch over time as memory is being used, um, kind of you have to almost imagine this on the picture because I don't have an anim animated slide here. Um, the uh, uh, OS is going to uh, be busy, and it's going to have applications being used, uh, using memory, and sometimes the page cache is going to be large, and sometimes it's going to be small. When, uh, when the uh, operating system isn't very big, or isn't, uh, isn't very active, the uh, amount of page cache is going to grow because there's nothing else to use that memory for. So um, at any given point in time, whenever you see this pig, I want you to think that uh, the memory that it has, uh, maybe some, maybe most, or maybe in some cases nearly all of the memory that it has right now is really being wasted, okay? I'm going to switch from uh, OS to Zen now. This is basically true of uh, any virtualization um, environment, but uh, I'm going to focus on Zen. Now, oops. Um, Zen uh, is a operating system of some sorts, and it needs space. So uh, it's got to sit in memory someplace. It needs space for its code and its data. And uh, um, uh, it has to reserve some memory for something, its uh, service domain, which is called domain zero in Zen land. And that's uh, an operating system, so it's a pig. It's a very special pig, uh, but it's still a pig. And uh, we'll, we can start up a guest. And um, uh, when it's started, a certain amount of fixed amount of physical memory is allocated for that guest. Zen partitions memory uh, between guests uh, to provide isolation, and it gives it a fixed amount. Um, any memory that's not left uh, not being used for a, a guest is left lying around in case you in the future have more guests that you want to put on that physical machine. So I'm going to launch another guest now and, and we'll see what it looks like. Okay. Now we have two guests and there's a lot uh, of memory that's still left over and we're going to call that fallow memory. Okay. We're going to mark that in red and uh, so it's more obvious and um, now, you can, if you look at the diagram, if you wanted to launch another guest that had that much memory, it's not really going to fit, okay? But you could launch more guests that don't have a lot of memory, smaller guests. And now we've done that, but there's less fallow memory, but there's still some fallow memory. 
And you can think of that memory as also being wasted. It's just sitting there. It's not holding anything useful. Wouldn't you like to do something with it? Well, actually, um, just like with a page cache, there's a lot of uh, dy dynamics in a virtual environment. And, and um, uh, if Zen has predicted the future properly, it maybe there is a reason to have that memory lying around. And say for another guest, which may appear out of nowhere. Migration, live migration, is one of the coolest features of virtualization. Um, but one of its constraints is that the memory for that domain has to live in two places temporarily. There has to be enough space on the machine that it's running on now, and there has to be enough uh, memory space on the machine that it's flying to in this diagram. So uh, you can't fill up every bit of physical memory on every machine, or there'd be no way to do this cool thing migrating virtual machines around. So fallow memory, you could say, just uh, does have some value. Okay. Uh, another important concept in virtual machine memory management, uh, something which was invented, I think, by Carl Waldsberger many years ago, is called ballooning. And uh, uh, ballooning is a feature that's in most uh, virtualization environments. And it essentially, it allows memory to be added or taken away from a guest in kind of an interesting way. If uh, you're familiar with this, this might be uh, um, a little bit too much detail, but it's, it's interesting, so give me a moment. Um, you could think of a balloon driver as a pseudo device driver that gets loaded by Linux, and it is almost like a Trojan horse. You load it as a device driver, and it communicates directly with the hypervisor. It goes around Linux. And when the hypervisor tells it that the hypervisor needs more memory, it can issue a VM alloc call to Linux, just like any normal device driver does, and get memory from Linux, and then send that down to the hypervisor. And it can do it the other way around as well. When the hypervisor has memory that it doesn't need, it can tell the uh, balloon driver, and the balloon driver can then take that memory and free it back to Linux. So basically, you're, you're blowing up a balloon within the guest. And uh, you can use ballooning to expand the guest to take up all fallow memory. If uh, uh, we stretch some of the guests out now to fill up that fallow memory and we don't have any more, but as we saw before, uh, if you give more memory to a hog, it's going to eat it all up, whether it needs it or not. So all we've really done is taken memory which was being wasted by Zen and reallocated it to guests who are wasting it themselves. So um, that, that, that's not very interesting. But worse, uh, now there's no fallow memory for incoming migrations. Now, since ballooning works both ways, um, you can not only take memory away from a, a guest with ballooning, you can give it back. Um, so when, maybe when you need to migrate a guest, uh, you can just say, balloon driver, take a lot of memory away from this uh, uh, virtual machine. And uh, uh, then you have enough to handle the in inbound migration. But unfortunately, this is where some of the nasty issues of ballooning show up. First, uh, ballooning is not instantaneous, something some people call memory inertia. You can't just take memory away from a guest. You think of it as a device driver model. The device driver asks for memory. It may or may not get it. Generally, it will, but sometimes it might not. And it might not get it very quickly. So um, sometimes it might not get it at all. Uh, this is because, as uh, we talked about earlier, every OS is always using all of its memory for something it thinks is useful. So it's got to throw away some memory. And to do that, it uh, needs to predict the future about what memory it's going to need and what memory it's not. And um, then the, uh, the memory that it's going to give up, as we saw, is page cache pages. That's what it has the lowest priority for. It can go back, in, in, in the case of some page cache pages, it can go back out to disk and get them again. So it, it does that. So in other words, if, you, if the uh, balloon driver asks for memory and that happened to be pages that the operating system did need, it's going to have to go out and get them all over again from disk, which is a performance issue. So third, and possibly worst, uh, the ballooning decision as to how much memory to take away from which virtual machines is going to be made by Zen or maybe by the service domain, domain zero. And neither one of those really has very much guidance as to what's going on inside of each one of those guests. So uh, it might not really be safe to take memory away from a guest, uh, but it's going to try to do it anyway because it doesn't know that. It doesn't know how fast it can take away. And if it guesses wrong, bad things can happen like out-of-memory conditions. So 
if we go back to our original challenge, um, you can see that uh, it is a hard problem that we're trying to solve. And we've got a pretty good list of reasons why it's a hard problem now. Uh, OSs are memory hogs. Zen leaves memory lying around. Ballooning can help, but it has problems of its own. And um, so it should be fairly obvious that we need a different way of handling virtualized physical memory, or physical memory in a virtualized environment. And that's going to lead us to transcendent memory. Okay. I can pause here for any questions since I, I've covered kind of the basics. Did I uh, skim over something too fast for everybody who understands? No questions yet. Okay. So um, I'm going to do an overview of transcendent memory, and we'll look at some real use cases of how it uh, solves some of the problems, and we'll analyze some performance. But uh, first, at the 10,000-foot level, what is transcendent memory? What we're doing is really surprisingly simple. First, step one, we're going to collect all wasted memory from all of the guests and from Zen, and we're going to collect it into a pool. Step two, we're going to provide indirect access to that pool of memory through a carefully crafted API. And that API is controlled by a set of restrictions that are imposed by the hypervisor. And that's really all there is to it. But, but the magic in this is really uh, in the characteristics of the API and uh, the semantics of uh, the restrictions uh, that the hypervisor imposes. So first, um, the API uh, does require awareness by the OS. So it requires changes. Some people call that para-virtualization. You can't take an unchanged kernel and, and use transcendent memory. So you can't run Windows if anybody in the room wanted to do that. <laughs> um, the changes, however, are, are very, very small, and we'll see some of that. Um, the interface is very narrow in that there are six uh, um, function pointers for Linux, and I'll show those in a minute, and they funnel down to a single Zen hypercall. There's a spec online today. It, the mechanism basically is it works by synchronously copying whole pages between the guest and the hypervisor. That's the underlying mechanism, copying pages. It's uh, multi-talented in that uh, we found a number of different ways to use it. And uh, we've got some of those working today. Others are investigation. Uh, there are probably other bright ideas. Some uh, people have suggested things. Um, so we've designed the API to be very extensible. For that API, this is what it looks like from Linux. Uh, you don't have to understand this in great detail. Um, the, uh, um, a pool is created with new pool. Um, then pages are put to it or gotten from it with these other calls. And we'll explain the other ones in a minute. And the lower level Zen interface looks like this. It's actually a single hyper call, but uh, to make it easier to read, um, pools get created with the new pool and get operated on with the other one. They, uh, they get combined into a single union structure, which goes through a single hypercall to Zen. So transcendent memory, which is that huge pool of uh, previously wasted memory, um, it gets dynamically subdivided into subpools. And when those pools are created, they're given certain attributes. And those attributes are described by a single parameter, a flags parameter. And we've identified four interesting combinations. There may be more. But uh, we're going to see this two-by-two two pool matrix a number of times, so I'm going to explain a little bit in detail uh, what these uh, things are. The first column is ephemeral. And uh, uh, what that means is that any data that's put into an ephemeral transcendent memory pool may disappear at any time. It's, uh, uh, the, uh, the hypervisor has complete flexibility as to whether to keep that memory lying around or throw it away. So if, for example, it's keeping a lot of memory for a guest OS, and uh, suddenly it needs to have space for a migrating inbound uh, VM to land, it can suddenly evaporate all that memory, and it doesn't cost anything. Um, persistent, which is the second column, kind of means the opposite. And uh, any data that's put into a persistent pool is going to be there, uh, and it's going to stay there, but only as long as the uh, virtual uh, machine or the guest OS is, uh, is there on that machine. If it dies, gets uh, shut down or migrated to a different machine, that data is not really persistent. So it's not like a disk. It doesn't live there forever. It just lives there as long as the guest on that machine needs it. Um, first uh, row private means that the data is accessible by only one guest, 
and the second row shared means that the data is accessible by more than one guest, and we'll see examples of that. Um, before getting into more detail again, some truth in advertising. Um, I've already said that uh, guest OS changes are required. Um, furthermore, this really works in a 64-bit environment only. Um, the Zen hypervisor has to be a 64-bit hypervisor. It's got to be a 64-bit machine, 64-bit uh, CPUs. Uh, it actually will work with 32 bits, but because of memory limitations, it's more of a toy. And in any case, it does work for 32-bit guest OSs. So you can still run 32-bit Linux in this environment. Uh, it just requires a 64-bit Zen underneath it. Um, the workload, uh, all the guests, if all the guests are quite happy with the amount of memory they have and you're not trying to cram as much as you can into a machine, um, then uh, TMM isn't going to really help much. It, it really works best when there's a lot of memory pressure and there's a bunch of different guests, and uh, statistically they're using different amounts of memory across time, then you can take advantage of the statistical aspects. Um, third, it's uh, you have to uh, configure the system. There are certain things that need to be done. It's not intended to work regardless of the environment. So in a, um, a web hosting environment, the web host provider would maybe give you a discount if, uh, if, you, made, if you allowed these things to be set in your environment. Um, and last, it's not a replacement for the existing memory technologies like ballooning or transparent content-based page sharing, also called KSM in the 2.6.32 kernel. It does complement them, though. So um, I mentioned that changes to the OS are required. And just last month, I posted a patch to LKML um, to, uh, on top of 2.6.32. And, and this is the diff stat. I don't know. Is everybody in the room? Hold, hold, you're familiar with diff stat um, output? Hold up your hand if you are. All right, most of the, much of the room. Uh, basically, a diff stat is a line by line, uh, one file showing how much change has occurred in that particular file, how many lines uh, have been added or subtracted. Um, so this, there's a four patches. Uh, this is the first patch. And uh, the green means a new file, and the black means an existing uh, file in the Linux kernel. So you can differentiate between whether it's uh, new functionality or it's something which uh, has some impact on existing files. Okay, so um, there's a lot more technical detail that I can get into, but uh, I'd rather go on to how TMEM is really being used by Linux. And uh, um, first, there's something that's called clean cache. And if you followed transcendent memory at all, it used to be called pre-cache. I was told that that was just too generic a term. It didn't mean anything. So it's been renamed pre, uh, to clean cache. If I say pre-cache sometime in the presentation, that explains why. This recently changed. Um, so first, looking at the lower right corner, you see that uh, two by two uh, matrix again. And you can see I circled something. This is a private ephemeral cache. And uh, clean cache is essentially a, a second chance cache. Or if you're a system architect, you might call it a, um, a page, uh, page granularity victim cache. Because basically, when a guest runs out of memory, it has to throw something overboard. And uh, that's called eviction. And as we saw earlier, some of these pages that it's throwing overboard might actually be something useful, and some of them might be wasted. So rather than just throw them away, what it instead does is it calls transcendent memory and takes that page and copies it into memory, which is available in the hypervisor through, a, uh, through the API. Then later, if it needs that page, it can go back and get it again. Maybe. It may be there, it may not, because the hypervisor decides how long it sticks around. So um, if the page is never needed again, it eventually is going to fall off. That's the arrow on the top. Um, the wasted pages eventually fall off the end of the queue and get thrown away by uh, the hypervisor Zen itself. Okay. So a couple of things uh, about clean cache is that the guest is responsible for coherency management to make sure that whatever is in the clean cache is uh, consistent with anything in memory. And that turns out to be not very hard, but it's important. Uh, if you miss it, then bad things can happen. And clean cache is an exclusive cache, meaning that when you get a page from clean cache, it's, a, it's the only copy. Um, it's as if a flush uh, occurred in the clean cache when, whenever you do a get. Um, one other nice feature about clean cache is that uh, um, uh, and TMEM in general, is that pages that are put into pools can be compressed, which uh, completely transparently, because it's a copy. And uh, that essentially doubles the amount of uh, pages that can be put into clean cache. 
and costs and performance that actually tends to be about 10 times as slow as a copy, I guess. But if you're really short on memory, you can turn on this feature and suddenly uh, it's like a RAM doubler from many, many years ago. Um, because clean cache is a private pool, a different pool is created for every guest. And actually, to be more accurate, it's every file system in every guest. And so each guest is, thinks it has its own isolated clean cache. And the TMEM code in the hypervisor is responsible for uh, managing the isolation and deciding when one page gets thrown away and one page gets kept. So we need what's essentially a, ne a memory scheduler. Um, the current implementation in Zen uh, manages this as a global LRU queue. But uh, because there's a possibility that uh, one um, virtual machine might be malicious, you don't want to have it take over all of TMEM. So it's possible for administrators to set weights to balance it. it the default is to trust, but uh, if you have, we used to say Coke and Pepsi virtual machines running on the same physical machine, you want to make sure that they can't uh, hurt each other. So we have weights, basically, that allows uh, that can be set by the administrator. Um, question? Um, the, the KSM implementation in Linux uh, that's used for KVM is actually uh, fairly complicated because of the fact that if, uh, if suddenly a lot of pages are unshared, uh, you don't have enough memory and you have to swap them out. Zen just recently added some capability for that. It'll be in the next release, but uh, it's not really uh, very well worked out. Um, because uh, um, transcendent memory is using clean pages in this case, uh, it can actually not have to deal with that problem. And I'm working through a, a, a patch uh, probably in the next few months, which will uh, apply a very similar concept into transcendent memory. But yes, uh, so uh, you have compression, you have this page sharing. There's a lot of opportunities now since you have copies and they're separate. They're no longer owned by the kernel um, uh, that you can now make the, the use much more efficient. OK. so. Um, a clean cache can be shared between multiple guests as well. If, if you have uh, uh, two guest OSs that are sharing a clustered file system, think of a cluster where some of the um, um, nodes are co-resident in the same physical machine. Um, you can see in the lower right corner, this is a shared ephemeral pool. And um, you can see in the diagram here that the puts are going into a shared pool, and the gets are going to individual guests. So this kind of acts like a server-side disk cache for a clustered file system. That clustered file system is out on shared storage someplace. Now we're using that same memory in a different way as a local disk cache, a server-side disk cache. And uh, you can see the difference between the previous slide and this slide now. Um, this is two separate guests that are not a cluster, and this is two guests which are in a cluster. Um, so uh, there were some security problems that were brought up in the posting that I uh, first posted this last summer. And uh, those have since been resolved in the 2.6.32 patch. And if you're a security expert, I'd be happy to talk to you about that more. So um, this is the Linux API for clean cache. It's uh, very simple. Uh, when clean cache is initialized for a file system, um, the uh, hypervisor then returns a tag or a pool ID, I call it, and uh, that gets um, squirreled away in the in the uh, in memory super block so that all of the other uh, access functions have easy access to it. And for get, put, and flush, um, there's an address space mapping, and for get and put, there's a struct page which uh, refers to the individual page of memory which is going to be copied to or from. Um, here's the diff stat for the clean cache patch, and this layers neatly on top of the TMM patch that I showed you earlier. Using um, the clean cache API, uh, a handful of very simple hooks get added in, mostly in the VFS layer. And this patch, these lines, so a few lines, 10 and 11 is the highest number there. The ones on the bottom are the, the new modules, they're new code entirely, so they're not uh, um, impacting the existing kernel code. But uh, this code implements um, ext3, ext4, butterfs, and ocfs2 file systems. So a little patch is required for every new file system that you want to add to this, but this is uh, for the big ones. 
And uh, for example, exe4, you can see there's a, a, a two-line patch. It's actually uh, include of a header file and, and uh, one line hook being added. OK. Um, another use of transcendent memory is something called front, uh, front swap. And uh, front swap is maybe the most important use of TMEM because when guests are being ballooned, as we saw before, they can run into some bad situations. Uh, first, uh, the four uh, quadrant diagram down there, you can see this is a private persistent pool. And what it does is it, uh, it's essentially a memory pressure safety valve, um, an emergency synchronous memory-based swap disk. So when a guest has been ballooned too rapidly, um, front swap is kind of like magic memory that can be instantly used. Uh, so that the OS doesn't need to wait for data to be swapped out to a disk, and that greatly reduces the chance that um, uh, bad things are going to happen, like a process getting shot by a, an OOM killer. So uh, the Linux API uh, looks like this. Um, because pages in front swap are persistent, you have to keep track of them, so there's a bit per, uh, one bit per page uh, array associated with every swap disk that's uh, configured. And there's got to be some way of forcing memory out of that. So uh, that's front swap shrink on that list. And those complications make this patch a little bit more invasive uh, for the swap code. The top two lines are uh, a, a header file and the, the main, one of the main swap files. You can see about 100 lines total there and a few other hooks in various files. But it's still not very big. So we've seen three of the four patches. Here's uh, the fourth one. And uh, this layers the Linux TMEM interface on top of the uh, Zen hypercall code. And to summarize the Linux patch, um, this is the combined diff stat of only the files that have changed in Linux. So you can see that for all of this functionality that we've added, transcendent memory, including uh, clean cache, front swap, and shared clean cache, uh, it adds up to 200 lines of new code. And it all works. So um, if anybody's interested in the patch, it's, uh, there's a link to it. Uh, the slides are available, so you can go take a look if you want. If you have feedback, I'd love to hear it. There was quite a bit of feedback when I first posted it last summer and less feedback from the last, uh, last round. So going back to the agenda, um, we've looked at uh, uh, some of the ways that the kernel can use uh, transcendent memory. So now, how, what's, what's the point of this? Does it work? Is it any good? Um, so we're going to look at some real running code. And uh, doing a live demo is uh, a bit complicated, so I'm going to use a screenshot instead. And uh, if you didn't pick up some binoculars on your way in, you should have. No, not seriously. I, um, I'm going to zoom in around on this slide so you don't have to read what's up here now. Um, it's kind of difficult to come up with a, a benchmark for this thing. There's just so many things going on and you want to measure uh, what, what's good and what's bad. Um, so I, I kind of uh, synthesized a benchmark. And what I'm doing is I, I'm going to create a memory constrained environment. And I'll explain that in a minute. I'm going to have eight virtual machines running. And what they're going to do is just repeatedly compile uh, the Linux kernel. And uh, it's a, a fairly simple benchmark. Uh, I'm going to zoom now into the lower left corner. Oops. I'm, so. Uh, what, what you're seeing here is really just a shell script, which uh, out, uh, gets piped into watch. And it used the dash D option to cause inverse video. Um, and so you can see a bunch of different statistics that are changing across time. This is just a single snapshot. Um, and uh, at the bottom, that's the output uh, from a, a Zen command, which shows the different uh, domains that are running. And, and um, as a result of this information, uh, just to, without having to see it real closely, uh, what you see is that um, the machine has eight CPUs because this is a Nehalem quad core dual threaded uh, machine. There's eight guests running. Each guest has 384 megabytes uh, initially, and it's, uh, they're all SMP um, virtual machines, two, two vCPUs. Uh, some of the guests over here, you can see uh, the seconds that each guest has been running. Some of them have been running for an hour. Others have just started, and I did that because I wanted to stagger the amount of time. Um, for each to make it more random. Now I'm going to zoom into the upper left corner of this. 
So uh, what I'm showing here is that we've uh, put the, uh, each of the guest OSs under memory pressure. I've aggressively ballooned down the amount of memory that each uh, uh, virtual machine has. And if you're interested in the details on that, how it's done, um, basically there's a field in proc mem info which roughly describes how much uh, memory this uh, machine is using. Can't predict the future at all, but it's a, a good estimator. So I, I do basically feedback directed uh, memory sizing in a balloon driver using that. And uh, uh, with the kernel running each, even though these were launched with 384 megabytes, each one is really only using about 140 megabytes. And all those other pages have been pushed out. Um, so uh, let's see. Zooming out again. I'm, I've circled four columns here. And uh, uh, data items in these columns are proc VM stat output, which show the number of pages have been that have been swapped in or out or paged in or paged out. And uh, these are just taken directly from statistics available in each of the guests. Um, these other four columns here uh, are um, data that's collected from TMEM. Again, there's eight rows, one for each guest. And I'm going to zoom into each of these to take a closer look. Um, the columns on the right uh, are showing, uh, first the column on the farthest right is showing uh, the successful clean cache gets. So each one of these has saved us from having to go out to the disk again and get a page. It saved us an I.O., a page in. The leftmost column shows the number of pages which it didn't save, which have actually gotten, been gotten from disk. The middle one is page outs, and clean cache doesn't help with page outs, but it just is there for completeness. And um, what we can see is that if you look at, compare the first column and the third column in each row, roughly a third of the pages have not had to be fetched from disk. Instead, they've been fetched from clean cache. And what that means, if you uh, compare with the time that's elapsed, Roughly 200 to 250 IOs per second have been saved here. Uh, looking at front swap, um, there would have been a fair amount of swapping required, but you can see that the number of pages swapped in and swapped out, the first two columns are zero, and instead those pages, looking at the first row, 79,000 in and 127,000 out, each one of those has been um, uh, taken from front swap, from transcendent memory front swap, instead of from the uh, written and uh, read back from the disk, and, and that saves another 70 IOs per second. Okay, so uh, 300 IOs per second, roughly, we're, we're saving in this benchmark. Um, interesting, uh, could be useful, but how expensive is it? So um, the implementation of transcendent memory in Zen has a, a lot of instrumentation, and it actually keeps track of how many cycles are being used by all the uh, common operations. And I've, I've done enough performance to know that there's some things that it doesn't measure. It's not measuring all the overhead in the kernel, and there's a hyper call and things. And, but it also, any time you add measurement code, it takes, it's measuring something that you don't want to measure. So just think of this as a, a rough estimate, an approximation, not a, an exact uh, measurement. But you can see, if you compare the amount of seconds which are spent in TMEM with the amount of seconds across the whole uh, uh, time in the virtual machine, uh, roughly one in a thousand or two in a thousand um, seconds uh, here. So roughly a tenth of a percent of a CPU is being used to save those 300 IOs per second. Okay. And the bottom line then is that uh, uh, to summarize, uh, 300 IOs per second, about a tenth of one percent. And this is just one workload. It was kind of random. Uh, my favorite workload, uh, a lot more performance analysis is needed. There's probably cases where it's worse. There's probably cases where it's better. Uh, but it gives you a rough idea that it's a, that uh, transcendent memory works. Okay. So um, still a lot of work to be done. Last item on the agenda. Um, the uh, uh, Two of the four quadrants, a clean cache and shared and front swap, are, have been implemented for months and are working great. The 2.6.32 patch is posted. Shared clean cache works. That's the uh, um, the clustering thing, but uh, I don't have an environment uh, where it's easy to test, and so I need to wait for other people to test that. So I'm, I'm not saying that's really done yet, although the patch is there. Uh, the Zen code is finished many months ago now. It's uh, um, last spring, I guess, and it's going to be in the Zen 4.0 release next month. Um, it has complete support for save and restore and migration, 
So the cool feature, a lot of things like this uh, don't have support for that, and so you're kind of locked down. This works in a, um, a web hosting environment very nicely because it supports that and, and provides advantages as well. Um, Oracle VM, the Oracle virtualization product based on Zen, uh, their 2.2 release came out last October, and that has this uh, uh, support in it, although we're officially calling it a technology preview. So there's still plenty of work to be done. Uh, Nitin Gupta, who did the um, um, comp cache in 2.6.32, compressed cache for swapping, uh, is starting to look at this to see if uh, transcendent memory might be useful to him. And he, he's also looking at use for uh, the FS cache functionality, which went in a couple of releases ago. If so, then um, this technology could also be used for NFS and AFS and other network file systems. We talked earlier about combining it with page sharing and looking at that. Um, Self-ballooning is currently a service uh, which gets uh, launched on top of the kernel when it's running. And I think it uh, works better, more interactive if it's built into the kernel uh, balloon driver itself. So I'm working on that. Um, uh, we've looked at three of the four quadrants. There's a fourth one, and it's called a shared persistent pool. And if you think about that, how that might be used, you see it could be kind of an um, uh, inter-guest communication mechanism, a page at a time. And we've had some thoughts about that. Uh, maybe it can be used in a fiber channel environment. I, I don't know. A uh, lot more performance work could be done. And um, TeamM was designed with all these interfaces not just for Zen, but there's most likely opportunities to apply it to uh, other, or maybe similar concepts to other environments as well. Containers, for example, um, KVM. Uh, there's a team in India working on an LGAST version. Um, I'm almost done, so let me take a question in a minute. So um, a lot of people contributed to this. Uh, Chris Mason of ButterFS fame uh, did the uh, VFS changes, and uh, I'm glad he did because uh, uh, finding the exact location for the hooks is a bit hairy, but it all works, so we got them right. Uh, a lot of other people have helped in various ways, and I've got some great feedback on the Zendevel list and on LKML as well. And before we conclude, I'd like to sing, thanks for the memory. I really could use more. My throughput's on the floor. My balloon is flat. My swap is fat. I have OOMs in store. Overcommitted so much, and thank you so much. <laughs> so there's a complete web page. Uh, all the information is there, the patches and everything, and there's my email address if you're interested in more. All right, any questions? Um, I've wanted something kind of similar to this for a while for, um, coming out of the kernel to user space applications. There's basically no way for me to ask the kernel, can you just give me some transcendent memory? Um, applications like Firefox and OpenOffice have a whole bunch of things that they keep uncompressed copies of, of that they know how to recreate very cheaply. Just blow up the JPEG again and you're, and you're saved. Uh, have you looked at exposing this to, uh, through the user space API at all? Um, a little bit so far. It's definitely an opportunity for um, further work. And uh, given the company that I work for has uh, a rather big database and uh, a lot of other uh, software products as well, it's certainly a direction that makes a lot of sense. Um, there are some challenges as well in that, uh, uh, for example, for clean cache, um, you can give the memory uh, to an application, but it has to be very aware that that uh, memory might disappear at any moment. So uh, if it does, if that causes any problems, then this doesn't work. Um, the, the front swap uh, has certain restrictions as well in that you don't want any guests to take up all of memory. So uh, yes, I think the answer is yes, there's some potential there, um, but uh, it's also not just going to be easy to do. Okay, next question. Do you have or are you considering any prioritization on the discard queue? Uh, uh, repeat that. Any prioritization of the um, There, there are uh, weights possible. The, the memory scheduler is implemented in such a way that it would be easy to drop in another one, just like there's multiple schedulers uh, in various places in Linux and Zen. It would be possible to uh, flip a switch and switch to a different scheduler. 
Um, and there's weights that can be applied to virtual machines by an administrator to ensure that uh, um, there's fair scheduling between them. I was more thinking uh, within the pages from a single virtual machine. Within the pages of a single virtual machine. Um, I haven't done that yet. Uh, in a shared, uh, there, there's a single implementation right now, and it works fairly well. I think there's more opportunity to examine that and, and make some choices across time. For example, a shared clean cache, if a page is gotten, it's not exclusive. It gets pushed back up to the front of the queue. So if one uh, um, cluster node is using a page, it's very likely that another cluster node is going to want it to. Question up here. So could you talk about the security assumptions you're making about the shared page cache? Uh, in particular, if uh, are you assuming that one VM isn't going to try to introduce uh, badness that could uh, corrupt the page cache of another VM? Um, it, it is assuming that and that the, the changes are uh, done um, in, for example, in this case, OCFS2. If there's bugs in OCFS2 that cause problems, then it could cause problems for other nodes. Um, the changes are so minor that I haven't seen those yet, but certainly you could get into a situation where when uh, somebody hacked a, a malicious virus into OCFS2, and in which case um, bad things can happen. Um, the default uh, is that it's safe, but uh, obviously you can uh, configure it so that, it's, uh, that they're not sharing at all. If you configure that it's sharing, you can set it up so that there's uh, um, handles that need to be provided. Uh, the administrator can require each of them to uh, provide a, uh, an encryption key, basically, to ensure that everything works. So I've got a, a couple of different layers in there. I, I think it's fairly solid, but um, it probably could use some um, uh, review by a security expert. Next question. So how, how, do, how do you uh, track, with, with your shared uh, memories there, how do you track between nodes that you're looking at the same memory? How do I track that I'm looking at the same memory? I, uh, since it's a shared file system, the file system is providing the index, if you will. It's actually a three-part index. And uh, uh, since this, every file uh, in the shared file system has some way of accessing it, an inode, for example, or a page uh, access into that inode, um, those values are the same. Uh, so gets and puts uh, use the same um, uh, access code, if you will. Does that answer the question? Okay. So how does your work on, tra on transcendent memory compare to the collaborative memory management that Martin Schwedeski has done a few years ago? Good question. Uh, IBM uh, proposed something very similar a few years ago, and it got, um, I don't want to say it got ignored. It got some discussion, but it was actually very complicated. I, I've been studying this myself for a long time, and I have to admit I still don't really understand the collaborative memory management paper very well. Uh, basically, what it does is it provides information that the hypervisor makes use of to choose. The hypervisor goes in and grabs pages. What transcendent memory does is it makes, uh, even though the IBM uh, term is collaborative memory management, I believe that transcendent memory is actually more collaborative in that the Linux and, um, and Zen are talking, uh, communicating information uh, through an API, and rather than um, the hypervisor being king, I guess, in the collaborative memory management model. In TMEM, it's more interactive. Yeah, CMM1 is uh, more like uh, some fancy ballooning, basically, and CMM2 is closer to transcendent memory. So you're, you're, you're talking about CMM2 when you're comparing transcendent memory, right? Yes, I am. IBM have actually canned CMM2. Mm -hmm. Question over here. For caching, don't we... Wouldn't it be great to have a hierarchy, so things going to transcendent memory from there if you've got flash or something and finally swapping to disk? Is, is that possible? That's come up a, a number of times that this might be a really good match for how flash would be used in a virtual environment. Because flash is just a device to an operating system, um, it can't easily be shared between multiple virtual machines unless you partition it somehow, which makes it very complicated because of uh, the way that flash works. Um, if instead you completely hide that so that the hypervisor owns the flash and it stores um, 
pages that fall off the end of transcendent memory into flash, then suddenly you have another layer of uh, backup. And uh, I, I, uh, I think that's something we'll probably look at in the future, but it's, uh, it's uh, probably anybody who has expertise in, in flash uh, could probably implement that fairly easily. And uh, since it's not directly addressable, it's, uh, um, you can really, uh, if you think about applying a clue to flash, a cue to flash, it makes it a lot easier to uh, um, uh, avoid the issues of having to uh, address and rewrite the same block over and over again. Okay. Red Hat is retiring Xen. It will not ship Xen at the next release of the Red Hat. What is the position of Oracle in Unbreakable Linux? Uh, wh where is it in Unbreakable Linux? So will it be shaped? So yes. it will be supported. Okay, uh, Oracle um, VM is a standalone environment which provides the hypervisor, but Oracle also provides, uh, essentially they're called virtual appliances by VMware for many of our products, included, which include an operating system and say a database or a Java virtual machine or something. Um, I'm working right now with our QA team to get uh, the Linux side of transcendent memory into some of those uh, appliances so that if you run Oracle VM and you run one of these appliances together, then team member will just work automatically. And uh, KVM? Uh, KVM. Um, yeah. Oracle uh, is the underlying technology for our hypervisor is then today if uh, it made sense to support more than one hyper, uh, hypervisor technology or in the future to switch hypervisor technologies, that's fine. We're, interesting. We're interested in uh, supporting our applications and, and uh, um, Oracle Enterprise Linux, and the hypervisor should be entirely transparent. For the foreseeable future, it'll probably be Zen. If that doesn't make sense in the future, then Oracle should be able to switch one out from underneath, and most customers shouldn't but care. both of them cannot cooperate. I mean... It, it can be either Xen or either KVM, right? Oh, so right. So you can't try it. Okay. Correct. Right. Um, I think we're about out of time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Gift on behalf of LCA. Oh, thank you. And I believe it's afternoon tea, so if you want to go across to the town hall and get some tea, you can.